Okay, well, so welcome everybody. It's great that so many of you are able to join us. Um, this is our historic Farmsteads on the Solway webinar, and this is the second in our Coastal Conversation series. Um, I'm Claire McFarlane, I'm the Partnership Manager at Solway Firth Partnership, and this is my colleague Anna Pollard um, from across the Solway, from the Solway Coast Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. Um, normally at this time of year, as we said in our first kind of of this series, we would be holding a joint conference and that allows us to celebrate the Solway Firth and the cultural and the heritage of the marine and coastal environment. But unfortunately, obviously due to COVID restrictions, we've not been able to get together in person. Um, but we've certainly taken this opportunity to come together virtually in a, to do a series of webinars. And as I say, this is our second one. So uh, bear with us with the technology because we are still getting to grips with it all. Um, and if you want to know anything else about our organisations, then you can visit our websites. Just Google Solway Firth Partnership or Solway Coast AONB. Um, and you'll be able to see some of the projects that we're working on currently and the resources that we have. And I think between both organisations, we've got lots of great images about the Solway. Um, so, and I'll just hand you over to Anna now and she will uh, tell you a little bit more about it all. Okay. Yeah, hello. So we're running this session as a webinar function on Zoom. So as participants, your camera and videos are automatically off. So feel free to relax. Uh, however, you can still participate. Uh, there's a chat option on your screen where you can post comments and observations to everyone in the webinar. Normally the icon is along the bottom of your screen. Just click on the icon, which brings up a separate window where you can add your comment. Make sure that you select the option of all panellists and attendees instead of all panellists. That way everyone can see your comments. Uh, there's a questions and answers icon too. So if you have questions for the speakers, please post those in the Q&A section along with the name of the speaker you would like to answer the question. Some of these will be chosen and answered at the end of the talk. Uh, so please note this session is currently being recorded uh, and live streamed. It'll be available in due course on both the Solway Firth Partnership and Solway Coast AOMB YouTube channels. So that now leads me to introduce uh, our three speakers. So we have Shona McCoy and Marie Isabel Marshall, known as Mizzy, uh, from the development planning team at Dumfries and Galloway Council. Shona leads the team of planners and specialist officers. The team produced the council's local development plan and provides specialist advice to future developers and on planning applications. Uh, Mizzy is a senior planner on Shona's team and has spent a good few years working in different local authorities as a planner and conservation officer in England and Scotland. Mizzy's found a real appreciation for the beauty of Dumfries and Galloway after city living, which I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. Uh, and then we have Peter Messenger, whose interest in vernacular buildings and building conservation began at Manchester University. Since then, most of his career has been as a historic buildings and conservation officer. He recently completed his PhD examining the impact of land tenure on the rural built landscape of North Cumbria. So I will now hand over to our first speaker, Mizzy. Okay, so whenever you're ready, Mizzy. Hi everybody, good evening. Um, I hope you do learn something. I've had to learn a lot. Um, Sean and I are taught, we seem to have given ours a very slightly different name, but never mind. Uh, the historic farmsteads on the Scottish side of the Solway landscape. <clears throat> no, not ready yet. This... I'm just trying to get my sheet in my, my screen to move on here. There we go. There's a quote in a book, this book here, um, by John Hume, who was a chairman of the Royal Commission for um, on the Ancient and Historic Monuments of Scotland. And he said that we are fortunate in Scotland in having significant physical evidence of agricultural change over the thousands of years since the Bronze Age. In terms of buildings, however, the evidence almost all relates to the period since the middle of the 18th century when an agricultural revolution took place in which large enclosed fields took the place of dispersed land holdings and regularly planned steadings, replaced 
uh, replaced clusters of buildings which housed both people and their livestock. He was an important person and he put that uh, in the beginning of, of the book for everyone to read. What he was emphasising was that there wasn't a natural gradual evolution from early farming practices to modernised practice practices. The small settlements which were known as farm tunes or kirk tunes if they had a, a church and the groups of cottages and little buildings of the tenant farmers were placed beside strips or rigs of the in-by land and they grew crops and they shared areas of grazing land which were called common teas. And the slide you see in front of you is Elrig, which is at the very western end of the Solway Firth. And it shows the sporadic buildings in the landscape there. And that's from 1777. And the next slide, which is a you can now see, is a modern um, map of the same area. And you can see that there's now a village down on the left hand side of the map. And there's also a large farm, but a lot of the small buildings have actually disappeared. Galloway cattle, really this is what it was all about. The Galloway cattle had a lot of very important characteristics. And um, they were renowned for their hardiness, for the quality of their meat, low input costs because they would eat virtually anything and um, locally they were used for milk. They were easy to handle, they had no horns. They were a whole range of different colours. And by the late 18th century, 30,000 of those cattle were being driven south into England, down to East Anglia. And the reason they were doing that was for the dung, which was fertilising the lands that were used for arable agriculture in East Anglia. There were, there were no fertilisers until uh, the 20th century. So, this was natural fertilization, something that in fact a lot of people are trying to go back to in the organic field. So quick, a very quick summary is the <clears throat> farming in Scotland changed at the end of the 17th century. Um, it continued. It continued into the 18th and 19th centuries, and it was basically the replacement of feudal farming and loss of commonties for grazing for grazing. And many families were evicted. Tenant farmers were evicted from farm tunes and their cottages. And some of those early buildings were destroyed or abandoned, which is why there are so few left in the landscape. And in their stead, instead of the little dikes and little drains, sorry, the little drains that separated the, the rigs, there were dry stone walls or stained dikes that, um, built instead. And this slide is of the landscape, a photograph of part of the landscape that was in the, the former two maps, which so shows the dry stone dikes and some of the remnant buildings. <clears throat> to modernise Scottish farming, there were new steadings needed and the newly rich planters from both coming from Ireland and mill owners, various industrialists, they had money, but they also wanted to have land and farms in Scotland. Unfortunately, a lot of that money would have come directly or indirectly through slavery. They wanted these lands, but they also wanted dwellings of some status rather than the single story cottages that previously had been where most of the, the tenant farmers lived. Our Loudon has he has a, 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 an encyclopedia of cottage, farm and villa architecture. It's also all got lots of information about furniture. It was really uh, nearly a book of showing people how to do things. But the example you see in front of you is um, a Kirk Maho, which is a little more inland than, than the Solway. You see on the left, Walter Newell House, the Walter Newell designed house. You see uh, an aerial photograph of the courtyard steading and on the right is the drawing that Loudon put in his in his encyclopedia of the same building, same uh, although it's very slightly different from what it is on the ground. <clears throat> Another example is Merce Head at Southwick. <clears throat> you can see it's very close to the coast. You see the Solway 
in the background. And you see the, the layout of the, the steading. It's actually a slightly later steading it's from the 19th century. And that's it more recently, but you can still see the, the compact form of the buildings on some more modern buildings. Now, what makes up that steading? Well, there are several ranges in either U plan or L plan or a full courtyard. There was a central area for gathering or loading. Many of those areas were cobbled. There was animal housing for calves, cattle, and cows for milking, cows for calving. There were sheep sheds, poultry houses, pigsties, stables, kennels, dovecots, and many of those the number of those varied or what was included varied on the, the wealth of the farm or what was actually farmed in the area. There were obviously stores for hay, grain, potatoes, wool, perhaps even for tack if it was a wealthy place with stables. There were, or they had a, a, a cart horse. There were working buildings that would include uh, dairies, horse gin mills, windmills, perhaps even a small forge. And then there were outside areas where dung was stored <clears throat> excuse me, haystacks were kept and perhaps wood was stored because that was maybe their main fuel. And there was human accommodation, including a house and sometimes other um, over uh, areas over some of the other buildings, some of the other uses included accommodation and then there may be separate cottages as well. And this is a slide that's taken from the supplementary guidance that will be, Shona will be talking about in a few minutes. And it shows a layout, a sort of a stylized layout, although it's, it's based on the, the Halstone farm. And uh, it's a very big courtyard. It's got just about everything in it and a very grand house attached to it. Now, Glasserton, is on the very west of the Solway again and on the Wigtonshire Peninsula and it was built, Glasserton Home Farm was built in the 18th century as a courtyard with stables added later in the early 19th century. And this is what it looks like today or a few weeks ago. Um, this is two photographs merged together. I've turn them into black and white because they look such different colours. Um, you can see it's a very large and grand home farm and it was a very important farm. It was uh, where the Earls of Galloway's seat was until the, the building was destroyed uh, by a mix of fire and just general lack of care in the 18th century. <clears throat> and it has a very special Ducot, as they call them in Scotland, or dovecot, as I would have always called them before, which is from the 19th century. It's now roofless, but it's really interesting, very interesting building, and has lots of very interesting stonework remaining in the, the ruined steading. And a very different steading, also 18th century, a farmhouse, including a horse gin mill, which is uh, the, the smaller building with the conical roof, and a, a tower mill, uh, another uh, a windmill, which have both have been restored. And um, I'm not sure that they're actually working, but the, many of the steadings have now got new purposes. And uh, it's called short rig and it's in, in good hands. You can see the aerial photograph and you can see where the, um, how it was in the sort of 1850s, which is where that map is from, the, the old map. And Shona is now going to talk to you uh, about how Dumfries and Galloway is trying to encourage the reuse of those vacant steadings through the planning policy. Okay, good evening everyone and um, thanks Mizzy for, for that um, introduction. I think we can see from, from Mizzy's presentation that traditional agricultural buildings are actually a really important part of Dumfries and Galloway's agricultural landscape and that they make a significant contribution to scenic landscape character um, and they also provide a direct and important link to the past. That was part of the reason why um, we decided to prepare supplementary guidance that would deal specifically with traditional agricultural buildings. Um, those are defined by Historic Environment Scotland 
as buildings that are of traditional construction and that were built before 1919. And they include, but are not confined to listed buildings or buildings within conservation areas. So the guidance that we've produced um, is intended as an introduction to a best practice approach to the reuse of traditional farm buildings. It explains why traditional agricultural buildings are important, what's special about them, and how they can be sympathetically reused, therefore promoting the sustainable evolving reuse of existing farm buildings. So why was the guidance needed? Well, as you can see there, um, since the Second World War, the number of farms is reduced by around a third, as farms have amalgamated and activity has been transferred away from many traditional agricultural building groups. But many of the traditional agricultural buildings are unsuitable for modern use and have fallen into disrepair, as again, Mizzy showed um, in some of her photographs there. But nevertheless, um, the buildings are an important opportunity for sustainable redevelopment and they also provide a chance to promote high quality design, which utilises local materials and traditional building skills. So the guidance therefore seeks to promote sustainable evolving solutions based upon thoughtful designs developed specifically for their location. So I suppose really the first question that really needs to be asked um, is whether the buildings or building are suitable for reuse. And there will be a minority that won't be suitable for reuse because of, for example, their scale. Um, some buildings will have floor to ceiling heights that are low, um, therefore don't meet building regulation requirements. Um, their importance, um, some buildings are an important part of a wider estate development or have specific historic or cultural significance. Some are also unsuitable because of their location. For example, some of these buildings are in very remote locations which can be difficult to access or service and other buildings may only be accessible by passing very close to other occupied premises or working farms. And then finally their condition. Um, some of these buildings might be in such poor condition that they'd have to be demolished and rebuilt or be very likely to collapse during works on site. So the type of appraisal needed will actually vary from building to building. Um, and any appraisal should really consider the building's fabric, details of its previous use, and examination of its wider context. All of these can provide valuable clues towards the way in which the building could be appropriately adapted and will assist designers in developing more appropriate and better integrated additions and extensions. And we'll come on to kind of detail of that in the next couple of slides. So these next um, two slides um, look at landscape setting. Um, as probably all aware, traditional agricultural buildings make an important contribution to the way in which we experience, in particular, the Dumfries and Galloway's agricultural landscape. In some locations, the traditional buildings sit within a flat, open landscape where they're very prominent and can be viewed from significant distance away. In other locations, they sit often with an undulating and often rocky landscape which shapes and frames a series of constantly changing views. Often they're located on higher ground between cultivated land and rougher upland grazing, which means they share a similar type of location as their neighbours. So the siting and the spacing between groups of buildings can vary depending on the location within, as again, Dumfries and Galloway's um, distinctive and varied landscape. So this slide covers the lowlands and uplands, and the next slide I think covers coastal and estuary. So again, it shows how um, the, the location and siting of these buildings has been shaped very much by, by the landscape. So the next few slides um, are taken from the, the guidance and show the approach that we've taken. Um, if you could go back a slide, Nizzy, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, you were on the right one, sorry, my fault. <laughs> um, as you can see, they've been done in a diagrammatic form and there's one, the first one always kind of shows what's considered to be better development. And then the other one gives sort of an example of really where it's gone wrong. Um, so these first two diagrams really make people think about the actual setting, just what we're talking there about landscape setting. So it's quite important to bear in mind to think that small changes um, to existing properties can actually have quite a disproportionate visual impact when they're viewed across long distances. 
So any changes or additions really should complement and integrate with a wider setting. Hopefully you can see um, the sort of detail that's, that's on there. Um, it's not intended to be prescriptive. As we said, it's meant to give ideas so we get innovative um, designs coming forward. Um, so moving on to the, the next um, slide, it starts to get into um, detail round about extensions. Um, this one covers extensions and the next one covers a new build. Um, so we've got on the left hand side what would be, you know, sort of original group of traditional steadings round about a courtyard. Um, and again, it shows what's considered to be better development and also where it's gone wrong. Um, so what we're, we're sort of um, suggesting is that really, you know, the existing development pattern must be considered, which again is coming back to the original principle of the appraisal of the actual building or group of buildings. Um, and quite often, again, as Missy showed in her slides, traditional agricultural buildings are often grouped together in a very distinctive and common, commonly recognised way. So we're suggesting that any new additions and extensions should be carefully located so that that distinctive identity is retained. Um, so going on to the, the next slide, it's looking at new buildings. Um, and again, it's suggesting you know, that it should be sort of located sympathetically as, as part of the, the existing building group. Um, any additions should use the same development pattern. Um, should be looking to identify opportunities to enhance existing buildings um, using similar proportions and so, you know, enclosed spaces in a, in a similar way. Um, I think the next slide as well covers more detail around about massing and proportion, particularly where the, this one's sort of seeking where you've maybe got your original setting and there's new build um, proposed. Um, so again, it's it's about keeping sort of scale and proportion, um, reflecting key design features, um, and obviously. Um, bearing in mind, um, you know, openings that are there at the moment, opportunities to perhaps maximise solar gain. Um, you know, a lot of innovative ideas that we're certainly looking to encourage. And I think the last few slides um, in my presentation are photographs where, of examples that, that have been um, converted. So as you can see this one um, down at Jordalyn near Kirkubri, um, it's been converted to residential. Um, again, keeping where possible existing proportions of the buildings, opening up where possible, you know, windows, as you can see in the gable elevation there, um, very sympathetically done. Um, the next slide is looking at Kinney Farm, staying again close to Kirkubri, um, which is be listed. And the next photograph shows, so there's before and after there, um, again, a very, very sympathetic um, restoration. Not really much change in terms of any extensions or additions or new build. Um, but again, just showing you know how you can bring quite a, a characteristic building back into a, a, a re reusable use and a, give it a new purpose. Um, so that's the end of, of um, our presentation. I'll now hand over to Peter Messenger. Mm -hmm. Right. Nearly there. Right. Um, thank you very much, Shona and, and Mizzy. Uh, unfortunately, I, as far as I'm aware, we don't have any advice and guidance, as you've just explained, which is a great shame because we're in a position where a lot of the things that you've just described pressure on these farmsteads and farm buildings are uh, growing every day and a lot of them are actually being spoiled as a result. Um, my presentation is really a, a look at the raw material that we have this side of the Solway and uh, an explanation why we actually have really two different uh, ends of a spectrum. We do have farmsteads that follow very similar lines to the way in which you described what happened in Dumfries and Galloway. And um, we also have uh, 
those that are actually completely the opposite, where there was no clearance and the buildings have survived. The building, the, the book that you mentioned, Buildings of the Land, about Scotland's farm buildings, um, as you described, says that most of those buildings are actually uh, post-1750. And we have buildings certainly um, two centuries earlier than that that still survive. Um, but if I move on to, uh, I'm sorry. Oh. Right. Okay. Um, th this is really uh, an introduction to the kind of uh, farms that existed in the 18th and the 19th century. Um, and the idea was in the agricultural revolution to convert them. Sorry, try again. So this. This is a plan from a book by Daniel Garrett. He published it in 1747. And this particular book was aimed at landowners, obviously large landowners with deep pockets for farms that would suit the northern counties, which included Cumberland and Westmoreland. Um, as far as I'm aware, I've never seen anything like this, but we do have farmsteads that have the kind of regular courtyards that Mizzy was describing. Um, the farmsteads that you've got on the uh, northern part of the Solway uh, are quite frequently large landowner farmers that have built them with regular courtyards. And we do have um, several large landowners, particularly in the northern half of uh, the region we're talking about. Um, that were able to uh, carry out a similar kind of process, removing tenants, clearing old farms and replacing them with new leasehold tenants and new farmsteads. In particular, I'm going to look at some of the farms around the Longtown area, which is uh, essentially uh, became the Netherby Estate. Um, the Netherby Estate didn't become the Graham's Netherby Estate until 1628. And before that, this particular area was noted as the debatable land. The, uh, the, the border, which is the Scots Dyke there and this line here, uh, was not determined until about 1552. And even after that, the people that lived in this area didn't really care much for uh, this particular uh, revolution. They weren't bothered about the border, they still carried on in their old ways. And it wasn't until James I, James VI of Scotland came to the throne, when as far as he was concerned, this area became his Midland Shire and the border no longer existed and didn't need to be defended, that he wanted to do something about it. Now the Scots, um, in their agricultural revolution, were able to remove their tenants uh, very easily. In 1555, the Scottish Parliament, which was obviously full of large landowners, decided to give them power to evict tenants virtually at will. The only stipulation was that they had to give them a date by which time they had to flit from the farm. And once that was given, then they could be cleared off the site, which is why um, what Liz has been talking about, there was a lot of um, activity on the parts of the people who were being dispossessed, um, who didn't like what was happening and uh, a lot of uh, 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 aggra aggravation occurred as a result. Here, the tenants needed to be removed, but it wasn't because of an act of parliament, it was simply because James VI, James I, took against the Grahams, uh, most of the people in this area would probably have agreed with him, um, for their activities. And it wasn't until about 1605, 1606, that action was taken against the Grahams. And eventually, I think over 50 families were resettled in the middle of Ireland. 
they had something before they went called customary tenure. And that gave them a reasonable amount of security unless they actually were guilty of criminal offences. Well, the Grahams were guilty of numerous criminal offences and they were forcibly removed. That actually broke the tenure of all of the farms that they vacated. And that meant that whoever owned the uh, area, they could actually insert farmers who were actually on a lease, which is why this says leasehold. And a lease was something that actually gave the landowner the power that he had lost um, to actually uh, retain ownership of the land. The customary tenants had actually got a bit of a, a hold on it. They would uh, be able to uh, pass the tenancy onto their heirs if they wanted to. In some instances, they were actually able to uh, sell the tenancies. Fortunately, um, one of the Grahams, uh, the son of Will of the Plump, which is why this is marked, called Richard Graham, became a friend of the Duke of Buckingham and Charles I, and eventually, as a result, became quite wealthy. And in 1628, he actually acquired this from the Duke of Cumberland, and that was the, uh, the start of the Netherby estate. Now, the uh, improvement of the estate took quite a long time to uh, establish itself. It took two centuries before they actually could really be called improved. Um, and what I'm trying to show you here is two of the farms that I've uh, picked, Smarmstown and Sandbed, which are near Longtown, or were near Longtown. And the two maps are fairly closely apart. I mean, there's 1839 and 1849. The small Smarmstown, 1839, it actually shows a U-shaped plan. In 1867, we've actually got another courtyard and another wing added to it, so that it actually looks like a very model farm. Sandbed, on the other hand, if you can see in the top corner, it looks hardly anything at all. Uh, a linear plan, in 20 years or less than, it looks like a model farm and unfortunately there's no way of knowing whether any of the original of either of these two survive because these were actually <laughs> cleared away themselves at this time by the government when they actually created an armaments depot on the site. This is a drawing that I managed to uh, photograph in the archive of uh, Sir James Graham, dated 1849, it actually shows the process. There was obviously a great deal of debate went on before they decided what they wanted to do, but that then became simply marks on a map. So the little circles are actually marking where the word out is written. These are the hedges that are going to be removed. And then for little Randall Linton across simply marks the fact that that was about to be removed in toto. So essentially, this is a similar kind of pro process that was a, uh, found in, in Dumfries and Galloway. Moving on to the next one. This is 1910, before the, uh, the de demolition. And you can see the farms have actually not developed much in the 40 years since but you've got these very large, reasonably rec uh, regular far, uh, fields to go with the farmstead. You've also got Longtown, which actually uh, was uh, a late 18th century development. It consisted originally of uh, a handful of clay dabbins, clay huts, which were removed and uh, a, a fairly regular township was developed from it. This was 1910, sorry, I'll go back and miss that. This was 1910 when the uh, valuations were done of all the properties in England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. And this shows that the farm, again, 
has not developed a great deal. There's a hay barn about to be uh, built or has just recently been built um, prior to 1910. But the reason I'm showing it is that we wouldn't know anything about the, uh, the actual workings of the farmstead if it wasn't for this detailed breakdown of what we have here. And it actually identifies the kind of farming that was being carried out on a lot of the Netherby estate. There are an awful lot of buyers. There's enough accommodation for over 140 cattle. And there is uh, virtually uh, a plethora of turnip houses, essentially to feed these animals. Uh, we've got pig holes, which actually uh, come into uh, prominence at the beginning of the 19th century in Cumberland and Westland, when Cumbrian ham became uh, quite famous and desired. Uh, the rest of the uh, accommodation really looks after straw and hay for feeding and uh, bedding for the animals. Those are the first few phases of model farms in, that are found in Cumbria. The, the final phase, um, which started from about the middle of the 19th century, doesn't exist on the uh, Netherby estate because by then they'd run out of money um, and they couldn't actually afford to continue their improvements. So I've gone further south to uh, Blennerhasset and Maryport to look at two examples so that you can see actually how they changed drastically in the late 19th century. And these two examples, Mecky is a bit of a, an oddity because it was uh, an exceptionally uh, well uh, built farmstead, but it was designed as an experiment, as a cooperative experiment. And the text at the top lists the various things that were actually produced for the benefit of not just the owner who was uh, William Lawson, but also for the individuals who were working on the farm. And he introduced a parliament for the workers. Theoretically, they could chosen their own wages, but there were conditions attached to that. Um, and added to that, they, they were given the opportunity of free, well, I say, say, they were given the opportunity of gaslighting, which uh, I'll show on the next slide. Um, they were happy with it until they actually got their first gas bill. The buildings themselves, actually, there's no courtyard here. Everything is built over. so. We have huge buildings that essentially are for cattle and then attached to them are buildings that are meant to uh, work for the provision of those cattle. So you have um, uh, a variety of uh, workshops, storage, food storage, uh, implement storage. There are other buildings attached to it, which uh, I'll show you uh, on this slide. This is the farmstead and this big block in the middle is what you were just looking at where the cattle are housed here. These are harness rooms and joiner shops and the like. Immediately next to that attached to it there is a, a, a pair of buildings that consist of a threshing barn and a processing uh, wing with storage rooms above. In the corner there is a hay barn, which obviously is uh, for immediate uh, feeding into the cattle housing. Down in this corner we've got the manager's house, the men's room for some of the labourers that didn't actually uh, live in the village, and also a chemistry lab where they were in, uh, examining how they could improve their manures. And then this double building here actually is uh, a variation of a, a bank barn. It actually has an access in the gable uh, where it, there is storage again. There's no uh, threshing, as I say, this is carried out um, in, this bar, in this building next to the cattle housing. But it also has accommodation for sheep, and that is rather rare. Um, and then in the opposite corner, we've got the gasometer and the actual production unit that gave the uh, farm its lighting and the village. The next example 
is Camp Farm at Maryport. And again, you still have, you, you have these huge buildings covered in cattle housing in the main, although the second, the second, the middle section is essentially a midden where all the manure is actually carried out. Both of these farms have hidden uh, drainage so that the runoff from the manure is actually collected and then it's pumped out to the fields. The thing that they'd learned by the middle of the 19th century was that if uh, you have a midden out in the open, a lot of the goodness out of the manure is actually washed away when it rains. But you can see that uh, this is cattle housing, cattle housing. This is a, a, essentially a, a huge loose box. And then these, these are buyers and loose boxes as well. The, there is a second section to the camp farm uh, farm. And this actually, again, has buildings that are uh, used for um, storage, for threshing. Uh, they actually have a granary. The granary is actually in this photograph in the bottom right, which um, is accessible with this rather dilapidated uh, set of stone stairs. Underneath it's the dog kennel, which is fairly common. And these are cart sheds. And in the far distance of that bottom right photograph, you'll just see um, what looks like a bridge. It is a bridge. The farm was built into the bottom of a quarry. And rather than actually build this barn uh, against the back wall of the quarry, they actually built a bridge to provide access into this upper barn. And then one of my favorite buildings is actually the one at the top right, which is uh, a hay barn, uh, which all of these were built about 1866. Uh, Mechie Farm was built in 1862. The Lawsons who had Mechie and the Senasses who did Camp Farm, they're actually uh, related by marriage. So there's a sort of a suggestion that the two farms are actually related in the way in which they've been developed. Move on. So manorial tenants, now we're moving on to not the large landowners, but the small farm owners, and I say that owners uh, deliberately. Manorial tenants were granted a tenancy on the land by the Lord of the Manor. And this is getting a little complicated, so I'll try and sort of make it uh, as clear as possible. That tenancy was governed by rules that were ma made by the manor court, made up of the Lord, his steward, and the tenants of the manor. And initially the tenancy was at the will of the Lord. Over time, it became customary to let the tenant pass the tenant tenancy onto his heir. And in many manners, it also became customary for tenants to be able to take out a mortgage on the tenement or to actually sell the tenancy. And by this time, the tenancy was regarded as being held at the will of the Lord, as we said earlier, and the custom of the manor. Custom of the manor. Unfortunately, this meant that they'd created a problem. It was a, a, a paradox because if the tenancy was at the will of the Lord, he could do what he liked with the tenant, similar to what um, had happened on the north side of the Solway. But as soon as he introduced the phrase uh, and the custom of the manor, and the custom of the manor allowed inheritance. The two actually didn't tie up. It meant that he actually couldn't get rid of his tenants. And as I'll show you with some of the examples from here on, those tenants, their rents quite frequently fixed in time and their fines became uh, less in value over the period of two or 300 years. So what did the customary tenants do when they realized, and they did eventually get legal backing um, on this power of ownership, not of the freehold, but of the tenancy. What did they do with this power? And I'm showing this map because I wondered at one time about why such built, some buildings had actually survived. 
in Cumbria and yet north of the border along Dumfries and Galloway where these buildings had survived for a long time up until the 18th century and then all of a sudden they disappeared. And the reason I think is what I just described is this customary tenure giving the tenants power over what they actually possessed, their tenancy. And you'll see these, these are crook buildings, they're about a hundred and something. Gruff Basand has got the most in uh, this area. But you'll see beyond sort of a line across from the, the Solway towards um, probably Cymru, uh, certainly the east of the county, there's nothing in the Netherby estate. There's a handful in this middle section, but nothing over here, which actually is the Howard estate. This is a map I made of the clay structures I found in 2015 from records. And there were over a thousand clay structures in Cumbria. Most of these are marked, but because they're so close together in the settlements, they all overlap. And again, nothing in the Netherby estate, some just north of uh, the Eden, so just a handful. I have actually got Cannonby and, uh, and Gretna, the wrong side of the border, but I, they were included in my survey. Again, nothing, nothing in the east of uh, this northern section. And the reason may be, if I can't, yeah, this is a map I made of 1688, the distribution of customary and copyhold tenures in this part of the county. Now, copyhold is very similar to customary. All it means is that the customary tenants uh, were never given any uh, receipt when they were admitted as tenants. And then it became law that they should all receive a receipt, a copy, of their admittance to the tenancy. So the copies then became copyholders. But the customs that they had to follow were obviously exactly the same as they'd been before they actually received the copies. But the line that I mentioned earlier, running across the middle of my map, is still fairly significant. There's, there are areas that you can see where there is still some copyhold and customary. But the two estates on either side are, the, uh, are where the, the blank areas were in the buildings that I was looking for. Whereas south of that line, it's virtually all copyhold or customary. So that was my theory, and I'm sticking to it. But this is Brough by Sands. This is the Solway up in the top right hand corner. And Brough by Sands, as I said, had an awful lot of uh, clay and crook buildings. And we'll have a look at certainly one of them. This is a map of uh, the, uh, the crook and clay buildings that survived up until, uh, well, most of them till recently. There are one or two that have been uh, lost, but not many. So we've got a lot of clay buildings and crook buildings and the one I'm going to look at is the one in the just below the centre with three little circles one on top of the other and this is Lamanby Farm, a long house um, but in 1910 it was only 29 acres now it was freehold but it was still re uh, required to pay, pay a quit rent of two, two shillings and threepence now the tenants in, in Brough by Sands were, must have been uh, very quick off the mark because they enfranchised their properties very, very quickly. With that, I mean, they bought their freehold, but they didn't quite get it all because they still had to pay a quit rent. And the quit rent was there because the Lord of the Manor didn't give them all of the freehold. He kept back the minerals, he kept back the uh, shooting, he kept back the hunting, he kept back the timber for himself. But for everything else, they could actually uh, say that they were free of the Lord of the Manor. Um, until fracking came along when he had the minerals and he was trying to get his money back. 
Anyway, sorry, that aside. Lamondy Farm is a long house. You can see in the middle a little uh, door just to one side of where the chimney is. There's a little door to the left of that, which was into a buyer. That's now gone, but the door remains. And then a big crook barn to the left of that. And then you have the farmhouse to the right of that cross passage, and then a little cottage on the, uh, on the end of that. So this is a 17th century longhouse. We've dendrodated it to about 1615. And um, with the cross passage, we've actually got um, a surviving longhouse because, as I said, the, 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 the buyer still survives, although that door would probably never have been there when it was still a buyer. Um, it was, uh, sorry, yeah. This, this was the first survey done of one of these buildings, uh, longhouses in Cumbria in 1953. And you can see the cross passage, the ingle nook, it's crook framed. And uh, this is the, the, the location of the buyer is obviously just to the left of the cross passage. There is a, an old door that's been blocked in the passage that did give access from the passageway into it. And then the crook framed barn beyond that. But it wasn't in, uh, as good a condition as you saw in uh, at the beginning of this section on Lamanby. This was how it was in 1988. And um, it was only with the aid of uh, English heritages, as they were, grant aiding the repair of the barn. And this was done in the traditional clay dabbing manner, probably the first time it had been done for a century at least. Um, and this was the finished article, and this is the crook, the crook barn that you can see, and in the distance you can just see um, the part that uh, houses the, the cross passage is actually being roofed over. So that's a 17th century building, 1615 or thereabouts. This purports to be, at Ratton Row, another long house, similar construction, although this stone surround with its remarkable lintel date, dated 1689, but with two family uh, sets of initials. Can't quite uh, work out why that was. We believe it's the Losh family, but again, that's a little bit uh, unsure. But this, again, is the same format, cross passage, but we managed to date the, the timbers and what came out of it was the fact that the left-hand side was around about 1505. The other side of the cross passage was 1586. And then there was another bit added on later that was, was probably uh, 18th century. But the purported date of this from a long time has been the date in the stonework over the cross passage entrance. But when you actually get in, you know, information like this, you realise that a lot of these farmsteads aren't of a single build. They quite frequently alternate. So one side of a cross passage would be rebuilt and then the other when that was uh, due. Um, but we've got three phases of building here that um, make this exceptionally uh, important as a special farmstead. There was a barn, or there still is a barn rather, but it's been converted into a house. Originally, that conversion was quite acceptable. I shan't say anything about what they've done recently. Um, but the, uh, the, the problem about retaining these is that if they're not listed and we're not aware of the condition or what they actually hold, because quite a lot of these farms you don't actually get access very easily. Um, sometimes they've been converted to houses uh, and we don't even know that they were actually farmsteads. Um, it's a matter of actually investigating everyone. And what Shona was uh, talking about earlier on was actually the need for when anybody is going to propose to alter any of these buildings that they should be investigated quite uh, 
quite seriously so that we know as much about them as possible before any damage is done to anything that's significant. This is the interior and this is when it was recently uh, recently thatched. It says looking at the watch to see whether you actually uh, yes, I'll have to uh, pass on quickly. The other issues I, I wanted to point out was that it's sometimes the location of the buildings uh, in relation to the landscape that give them their form. This is Newtown, which is actually um, linear in fashion and it's on one side of the road. The reason for that is these linear fields, some of them survived until the 20th century, these long strips, but they're actually designed to look out onto what was moss. This was a waste ground. It wasn't arable or farmland. That's why it's only on one side of the, uh, of the roadway. When it was actually uh, improved and drained, then it actually became farmland. They kept all of the land on the other side for the buildings. And a lot of them were taken over by the hostels. And I'll move on quickly because Eventually, at one time, they owned 11 of these tenancies and a lot of these farmsteads have got initials and their farm names, their, their, their uh, family names. But in 1910, a lot of them were customary or copyhold and freehold and that the hostels still owned uh, the tenancy to, uh, to four of the tenements. This is a, a, a grieve ship or a township. I, I have no idea why they decided to put the tenements, uh, farm holdings in the middle rather than along one of the roads because it actually meant that the farms themselves were very, very cramped and only on the outside were they actually given room to uh, expand. One of the farms in this, this, this one here actually is situated on uh, both sides of the road. Well, yeah, that's Miss Wilson's tenement. And that was uh, in uh, 1910. And in 1910, she was paying, because she hadn't enfranchised, the Lord's rent. He was getting 17 shillings and sixpence every year for actually still retaining the freehold of this property. She was renting it to another person. She didn't live on the site. She lived at another farm for £135 a year. One of the farms, this is uh, the Barwise property, shows just how uh, conservative, I think is probably the best way of describing it, uh, the farmers could be in that they didn't, uh, if they could, get rid of anything. This was just a, a, a buyer built into the back of a field, but because it actually could be ramped, someone came along and added on an upper floor and it turned it into a bank barn. But if you look around the corner, this shed still survives and there's a, the remnant of a clay building there, but it's underbuilt by stone. Why it couldn't all be built by stone and take out the clay, I don't know, but this is another example. It's a hideous piece of workmanship, um, but it's a 1778 house. Again, this lintel over a cross passage, um, but you've got brick, stone, cobble uh, and clay. And the clay is significant because over the, uh, the other side of the uh, drive, is this little rendered section which is clay and then the rest on either side is stone and cobble but inside it's got this crook frame but they obviously didn't trust it when they're actually adding on a section of stone walling so they put a truss in just in case. This is a model farm or it looks as if it should be. This is a midden but it's dated 1884 this, and you wouldn't normally have got a, a, an uncovered midden, but this was actually redeveloped by, um, he wasn't a tenant, he wasn't a farmer, he was an iron master from White, Whitehaven, but he decided to buy this farm 
for his brother-in-law who farmed it for a short while, but he actually built, rebuilt rather, this set of barns and created this bank barn on the back. But this, as far as I can say, see rather, is virtually a, a model farm. It probably should have been pre-1850, but he has a turbine house. He's got a lock just up the road and he channels the water into it. This is the ramp into the, uh, into the barn and uh, the granary is next to it. The only thing I think that survived from the earlier farm was probably the house. So when they had the, fund the fundings, the tenants or the farmers who actually are the people who acquired these, uh, these farms were interested in actually carrying out proper improvements. I've just stepped over the border, Mizzy and Shona, sorry, but I've only just come across this. Um, a friend of mine uh, lives there and it's at my, I have to say, Meekledale. Tell me whether I got that wrong or right. But it's a, it's a form of bank barn, which there aren't many of in, uh, in Dunfries and Galloway. And instead of actually having a barn entrance, a, a cart entrance, it's got this small entrance, almost a loft entrance, that's got steps up to it. And finally, or no, sort of penultimately, you may know of this one, because this is Prior Lynn or Prior's Lynn Clay Barn and Byer at Cannonby. I took that in 2006 when it was looking very poor. And recently, the thatching has just been finished on it, which is the traditional thatching. The walls have been re, re uh, repaired where necessary using traditional uh, techniques. I couldn't find anything between Cannonby and Stranra that said it had clay and yet I was looking through an article while I was preparing this and I found this photograph which it purports in the article to say it's in Dumfries and Galloway. So I, I have a final plea can anyone tell me where Calden Hills Farm is? If they can, I'd like to know if this building still survives. But that's, that's me finished. Sorry, I've gone over. Um, right. I think I'm that's great. Finished. Thanks, Peter. You did go over a little bit, but we don't really have many questions. So I think we can forgive you for that. Okay. But we have got a couple. So um, shall I start with, if I can find it? start with the first one which was actually for Mizzy. So Mizzy and Shona could you put your cameras on? And there was a question for you Mizzy which was was there any use of steam power for threshing in some of those buildings? Do you know? I've already answered that one. I don't know of any steam powered ones but I bet there's one or two and our archaeologist would know. Um, uh, my answer to that was that we probably have a lot more water, so a lot of water powered, as well as obviously horses and, and uh, possibly cows as well. But uh, I think it certainly wouldn't be common, It'd be very rare if there are any and if there are any surviving. So I don't know was the answer. quick answer. <laughs> um, Shona, a uh, question for you. Um, you talked about design principles and settings. Um, are there any designs that you've thought are particularly um, innovative and any ones that just made you go, oh, no? Oh, that's a good question. Um, oh, there probably are some good examples, but when you're asked that, your mind always goes blank. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have any off the top of my head. Um, I mean, Mizzy included a few. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, last weekend, Mizzy, so I did a, a drive along the coast to, to see if we could find some some examples. Um, and yeah, there's a couple included in the presentation. So yeah, and I would never I would never name someone that you can, or a dead development that you would go, oh, yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> that one that might not have actually got produced, but yeah. No problem. <laughs> okay, so I've um, got a question for you, Peter. Um, from Malcolm, who says Ratton Row, the development in 1505 and the cattle extension was later in 1586. Do you know why that would be? 
Uh, yes, well, it actually, it, it, by then it wasn't a cattle extension. By then they'd actually turned it into a service room. So it became actually uh, part of the house rather than uh, a farmstead. But, and, and one of the, the other reasons is that they actually, uh, um, um, when they created the barn, they actually put accommodation for cattle in uh, one part of that. But um, it was a very small farm and um, the accommodation would have been very, very modest anyway. Yeah, thanks. Good. Okay. Um, so, um, Peter, could you tell us any more about the chemistry lab? It there? Was it the mechanic farm or mechanic farm? Uh, I, I don't really know a lot about the chemistry of manure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Essentially, what they were trying to do was, was, was uh, retain all of the goodness, the, the ammonia, and uh, not let it leach out into, uh, into the water system so that uh, it, didn't do the, it, it didn't get put onto the land. So um, I, I can only suggest that they were actually looking for uh, ways in which they could uh, maintain the high ammonia level in the uh, in, in the liquids that they were actually uh, collecting, because they did collect the liquid. They didn't waste anything at that time, and, and it was all pumped back out onto the fields. Mm. The, the last example I showed you had exactly the same kind of system. Underground drainage into tanks, and uh, the, the midden that was open also had tanks underneath it, and then it was, it was pumped directly out to the fields. Right. Um, I've just got a question for Shona, actually. So at the, the example that you gave, which was Canny Farm, the one beside Kirkubri, that was an amazing kind of round tower that it had there. Was that built as something, I, I realise it looks like it's accommodation after it had been developed, but was it always built as an accommodation block or would that have been some other part of the working farm? Or can you tell? <laughs> yeah, I think it might, Missy might know better than I do actually, but I think it might have been part of the working farm rather than accommodation. I don't know if Missy might have something to add. Yeah, it started off as a tower windmill. Oh, okay. And then I believe it became at some point, it was some kind of dairy and it was also a cider house at some point before it became accommodation. So, and it can be rented out because that's where I, <clears throat> sorry, find the photographs. <laughs> <laughs> they don't mind me publicising it. It looks like it'd be really <laughs> nice to see yeah. there, actually. Right there now. Yeah, so, I mean, it is, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, going back to the question that was asked of Shona earlier, I mean, some parts of that development might be a wee bit over-domesticated, domesticated, if that's a new verb, then, um, but uh, other parts of it are fantastic, so, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, Peter, one for Peter, when do houses and farm buildings cease to use crooks? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, the, the, the latest ones that we've got uh, are in the 17th century, and um, we probably have them later than that, but not much later, um, because fairly soon into the 18th century, they started, like you saw in the barn, um, where there was a crook and a tie beam, a tie beam truss. They sort of started to become popular in the 18th late 18th and then into the 19th century. So there's sort of the crossover is in the, in the early 18th century, I would say, but we don't actually have any, uh, any dated examples. Right. And um, so there's a, a comment from the Dumfries and Galloway side in the chat, which was saying about the Coup Palace near Borg, um, which is a good example of a building that's obviously been redeveloped as kind of accommodation. And the comment there was, do some self-builders still use croc? So I don't know, Sean or Mizzy, whether you're aware of MD in Dumfries and Galloway that um, has still used croc in any of this kind of self-building kind of projects. I, I'm not aware of any, any croc frames coming in as planning applications. I mean, the most recent um, application, anything to do with croc frames was Pryor's Lynn that uh, Peter's referred to at Canonby, which has been um, uh, restored. Yeah. So no was the answer, but yes, Coup Palace is very interesting, but it is actually 20th century, very early 20th century. 
And um, so while it would have been nice to use as, as an example, it is really very, very different from a lot of the other uh, buildings. And there were only 12 cows ever occupied that and they were treated like um, like royalty, I think, is mm. a fair way to put it. But it's a really interesting building and worth looking into as well. That's mm. near Borg. There was somebody I know from Borg who is uh, here. Um, another one for Peter. Um, so, how many farms had men's room? <laughs> Lots. I mean, um, I can't think of there being many that didn't have a men's room. Um, certainly, anything before the uh, beginning of the 19th century, they all had a men's room because they had to put some. I say they all had to have a men's room. They had to put somewhere. They put, put them somewhere, yeah. Uh, occasionally it would be a boffy of some kind that would be separate, but um, it was simpler if they had a space within uh, the house that they could actually occupy, just a simple, simple room. Um, occasionally they actually created a, a part of a, a barn or a buyer. Certainly over stables could be used as a boffy, um, and occasionally over... Uh, uh, granaries. Um, there, there are one or two that suddenly have uh, a small chimney added to them at the first floor level. Um, so, yes, I, th they were they were uh, they were absolutely necessary for uh, giving some kind of accommodation to the to the labourers that worked on the farms. Um, and you've seen from some of the examples that the housing accommodation was usually fairly small. I mean, if if Rat and Row had two families living in it, then there wasn't any room there for any, any men to be uh, uh, settled in. Uh, they might have got into the loft space, but I doubt it. That would have been a bit too far, but um, then no, they actually needed to provide it. And um, the, uh, the 1910 uh, field books actually list them endlessly as, uh, as being uh, part of the uh, the farmstead, wherever they happen to have found the space. Okay, so um, there's just a couple of comments actually, just following up on some of those. Apparently there is a new crook build at Hill Tower in um, Dumfries, so that's one to kind of perhaps look at, look out for a bit more. And then somebody else has kind of um, raised the kind of issue of how do you solve the problem of car parking in these subdivided farmstead you know where they've been converted because there can be so many cars but I think that's probably not a question more of a kind of comment <laughs> and then uh, just the final actually a question I think this will be the final one was um, Peter have you written anything about Cumbrian farmsteads that people can read oh you're on mute Peter Got yeah, uh, I hate to mention it, but yes, um, <laughs> a long, long time ago, and then 50 years later, um, something new. Uh, no, I've, I've done a recent article in a book on crocs, which um, some of the, uh, the pictures that you've seen uh, are included in, which was is essentially looking at the problem of tenure and survival of crook buildings in North Cumberland and the fact that they don't exist in the northern half of the area that you were looking at. Um, but a very long time ago, I wrote an article on Lowther Farmstead plans. Um, I, won't, I refuse to give the date, <laughs> <laughs> but it can be found if you actually uh, go to the Cumberland and Westland uh, website and, uh, and put my name in, it'll come up with it. Yeah. Lowther Farmstead plans. But, well, uh, as a, uh, following on from this, Anna, I'm sure that we can put up the, the kind of some publications that you've done, Peter, and also the Dumfries and Galloway, you know, the links to the guidance that we've obviously, Mizzy and Sean have obviously been talking about. So um, we can certainly provide that information as a kind of follow up. And um, there aren't any other questions. Anna, can you say any other ones before we finish? No, I think that's pretty much it. In terms okay. Of yeah, go for it. Can I can I uh, borrow your uh, guidance? Show it to people around here. Yes, time, yes. It's, um, time came and and started to do the job properly, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'd I'd like to do that. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's it's there as a as a public document. I mean, it had I didn't say at the start of my presentation, but it did have a, a long gestation period, um, and it originally started as a. 
publication for a Solwith project that was run oh, a number of years ago now, sort of a lottery funded project. Um, and it was looking particularly within developments in the national scenic areas, but we decided to widen it out to cover all of Dumfries and Galloway. Um, so that's how we've, we've ended up adopting it, because as we said, there's, there's so many buildings. It was useful to provide guidance. Thank you very Great. much. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So I think we'll kind of wrap it up there. I don't want to keep people too long. Um, but I just want to say a huge thanks to all the speakers, so Peter, Shona and Mizzy, because actually it's been really fascinating. And uh, I think we can really tell that because we maintained the same number of um, attendees at the beginning that we pretty much did at the end. That's always a good sign. And thanks to everybody for attending. Um, and so, yeah, I'm sure that if you're interested in learning more about it, we will put some links up. Yes, yeah, so we'd love your feedback as well. So the email address can be found in the Eventbrite reminder, info at Solway Coast aomb.org.uk. You can also use our social media channels, Facebook or Twitter. Uh, there is a historic recipes talk on December the 17th if you're interested and a few more coastal conversations will be happening in the new year on topics such as geology and dynamic dunescapes. So you can check out our website and social media for more and um, we hope you've enjoyed it and uh, you can join us again next time. Okay, thanks a lot guys. Thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.